You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Picture this. You're eight years old and your mum is late home from work. You become convinced that she's had a car accident and she's dead. Everyone has intrusive thoughts, but if you live with obsessive compulsive disorder, well, it becomes something much more extreme and debilitating. Like being nine years old and for absolutely no reason, becoming convinced that you have HIV. Or being 13 years old and feeling certain that you're pregnant, even though you've never even kissed anyone. When you have OCD, you get stuck on obsessive thoughts and you cannot move past them. It's unrelenting. Believing something will happen or has happened will play like a loop in your brain, repeating again and again and again and making you doubt what's even real. So to neutralise the stress of those obsessive thoughts, you start developing obsessive habits. I think when it shifts into OCD is when you get into a real loop, like you can't think about anything else or you can barely do anything else until you've reached some sort of certainty in your mind because you've started to convince yourself of whatever that fear is. From Mamma Mia, you're listening to No Filter, a podcast where people from all walks of life tell their stories very candidly and aren't afraid to be vulnerable. My name is Mia Friedman. Penny Moody was 19 when a psychologist first hinted that she might have OCD, also known as the doubting disease. And since that moment, Penny's been managing and living with OCD. You've probably heard about obsessive compulsive disorder, although OCD is widely misunderstood and misrepresented. More about that in a moment. But relationship OCD is something you've probably never heard of. I know I hadn't until I heard Penny talk about it. And it's a type of mental ill health that affects a surprising number of people. Penny is happily married and she has two little kids with her partner, Hugh, and they're all currently in their sixth lockdown in Melbourne. Penny took some time away from them to have a very candid conversation about living with and managing OCD and specifically relationship OCD, something that she struggled with since she had her first boyfriend in high school. Here's Penny. Your psychologist mentioned that in every generation, there's a sort of a global event that can trigger OCD in a lot of people. Can you explain her theory about that? Yeah, basically the thought is that at a time when there's a lot of maybe hysteria about a topic or there's a a lot of media attention on something or there's just a big focus on a certain issue, it's kind of like the perfect storm for Mm. people with OCD. It can create really awful obsessions because it's sort of perpetuated by everything outside of their mind, like everything that they might see in the media is talking about a certain issue and then it just kind of snowballs. So it was syphilis in the 20s? Apparently, yeah. Apparently 20s it was syphilis. I think around like the 60s there was a lot in the media around asbestos. Yeah. And that became something that people were really concerned with. Not to say that people now, a lot of people with OCD now don't worry about those things because I know they definitely come up, but it was maybe just um, there were more people who were worried about that. And then, you know, I think from like maybe the late 80s onwards, the fear of getting HIV or AIDS was a really big one. And you can see why. Like mm. there was just so much going on, you know, those um, Grim Reaper ads on TV in the 90s and all this uncertainty I think really perpetuated that. The idea of OCD being something about washing your hands is mm. a bit of a cliche. For some people it's true and cliches are often mm-hmm. true. A year ago at the beginning of COVID, it was all about hand washing, Mm. which almost seems like a more innocent time now, the idea (laughs) that by washing your hands you could avoid catching it. For someone who actually has OCD, when someone says, I'm so OCD, 
How does that make you feel? It's kind of offensive, I guess. I think people never mean it to be offensive, but I think it can really kind of diminish people's experiences. It's one of the reasons OCD is so misunderstood because it's just kind of been diminished and it's been almost watered down, I think. Mm. You know, I think a lot of people maybe see it as a quirk, like kind of a funny thing that's just like you're a bit anal and you have to have things in a certain order or you have to be clean or it's just a real shame I think that that's the case because it means that people don't really realise I think how devastating it can be as a mental illness. So for those people who still think it is about washing your hands or flicking light switches or checking that the toaster is unplugged, is that true? For some people, yeah, absolutely. So for some people, you know, their obsession or their fear might be contamination. So, you know, they'll be worried they'll catch something and then they will have to wash their hands. But it won't be like, oh, I'll just wash my hands a couple of times and then I'll leave the house. It can be like some people won't leave the house because they don't get that certainty of like, yes, I've done that and that's done. Now I can move on. It's that whole like, what if? No, what if I didn't do it quite right? And it can just happen over and over again. Or if someone, you know, is scared that they haven't locked up the house or there might be intruder because of that, or it'll be checking. So it'll be going back and checking, but it'll be checking again and again and again and again. And that probably won't be the only obsession that they've got. It might be one way that it's playing out, but they might have a lot of other things that's going on as well. But I think that's been how people view it because it's very overt. Like you can see people checking. Mm. Whereas you can't see someone's thoughts. Exactly. You can't see someone's thoughts and a lot of compulsions play out mentally. Or people might have compulsions that they perform, but they do it when no one's around. Mm. That can definitely play out in that way. I remember when I was in high school, I watched Home and Away and like so many people, and I remember there was a storyline, there was an OCD storyline, and I think it was... um, Sally, I think it was Kate Ritchie's character who had OCD for like a couple of episodes and it was the whole thing of like she had to wash her hands and it didn't really go into it, you know, very deeply, which is fine. It's home and away. But like it was like she went through a traumatic event and then she had to wash her hands and it was quite distressing but then she moved on from that. Like little did I know I'd had OCD for like over 10 years by that stage but I had no idea And part of the reason is because I watch things like that and go, oh, that's what OCD is. Like, I don't have that. I don't have to wash my hands. So that's definitely not what I have. And I think that's been a real problem. Do you remember how old you were when you first started having worries? I think I would have been about six or seven. And what did you worry about? One thing I really worried about a lot, which I think a lot of kids do, was that my mum and dad would die if they went out for dinner, I'd get so worried that they would, you know, have a car crash or something on the way home. And that's, you know, pretty normal worry, I think, of little kids. But then to try to neutralise my fears, I would develop these kind of rituals that I would do. And I would be like saying things in a certain order and then touching wood before I went to bed, just doing that. And in my mind, that was keeping them safe. So it was like all the responsibility was on me to keep them safe, which sounds ridiculous, which it is, but I didn't know. And then another way it kind of played out was, for example, if I was reading a book, I would very rarely get through a whole book because I'd be reading and, you know, it would set up the scene, maybe describe where the character was. And in my mind, I had to like visualize it perfectly, like visualize the character and the person and set it up in my mind So there was no doubt about what it looked like. You just can't really do that. And I would constantly do that and I'd get really distressed if I couldn't. So I'd often just stop reading the book. So there were so many books that I'd started and I never actually finished. But that's just another example of how it played out when I was really young. And it wasn't very noticeable. Like I just thought it was normal. That's just what everyone does. And did it kind of reinforce for you the importance of that ritual because when you did Mm. touch the wood and you Mm. did say those things, then your mum and dad would come home and they didn't die. So you Mm. better keep doing that because that's what kept them alive. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're spot on. I think that's right. You know, they came home every time, so I kept them safe. (laughs) So I got to keep doing that. And I think one of the really cruel things about OCD is that the compulsions make you feel safe for a little bit of time, but then after a while, 
it comes back. I mean, you know, there's always a what if question to everything, you know, mm. to everything you do or everything you tell yourself. So it just makes it worse in the end. But yeah. When you turned eight or nine, your worries became a little less run of the mill because you're right. Mm. Most little kids are worried that their parents are going to die. It could be argued mm-hmm. that that's a very sensible worry to have when mm. you're a little kid because. Mm-hmm. You know, it keeps you close to your parents and ensures your survival and you know that your survival depends on theirs. Mm. When you got to eight or nine, what did you start worrying about? I started having the fear that I had AIDS, which is pretty heavy for a little eight-year-old. What did you know about AIDS? I didn't know a whole lot, but we'd moved countries. So that was a bit of an upheaval, I guess. We were living in Geneva because my dad was working for UNAIDS, right? So it was something that was in your world. Yeah, it was talked about, you know, here and there. And I, I didn't have a great understanding of it. And it wasn't even so much that. It was more, I just remember seeing like ads on TV at the time or like documentaries or little snippets of documentaries of of people who had AIDS. And, and that Grim Reaper ad with the little children falling yes. over with the bowling ball. Yeah, it was terrifying. Yeah. And I just started having this like, oh, my gosh, well, what if I have it? There must be a way that I could have got it. And then what if I pass it on to everyone I know? And How did you think you'd got it? Oh, I don't know. I think at one stage, like, I think I went to the toilet once and there was like a bit of blood on the toilet seat. It might not mm. have even been blood, I don't know, but it, I convinced myself it was and I started to worry that, well, if I had a cut or something, mm. I could have sat on that and then I could be infected. And the thing was like I would always talk to my mum and dad about these fears and they would try to convince me that absolutely there's absolutely no way you could, like it's just not possible and but there's no way of allaying these fears with logic. It mm. doesn't work, especially for a little kid. So I would go to my mom and I'd say, oh, I think, you know, I might have it because I did this or because this happened or what if this happens? You know, she would talk me through and she had no idea. No one had any idea this was OCD. It would just try to make me feel better. And I'd go, oh, okay. And I felt safe for, you know, maybe a few minutes or an hour or an hour or two. And then I'd have another another thought creep in and go, no, but what if I didn't explain it right? I'll have to go back to her and ask her again. And then once Google, you know, came onto the scene, like that's oh an God. absolute minefield mm. for people with OCD because it's a way of trying to check. Explain to me how you use Google to check. Well, I think there'd be times where, you know, you'd, I'd Google like, can you get AIDS from X, Y, Z? And you can find anything on the internet and it's never going to make you feel better because you're going to get into this deep, dark hole of more what if questions. Mm. But I also know a lot of people who've had the same kind of HIV fear. And this is not to stigmatize anyone with HIV because it's not even the HIV itself. It's just the uncertainty of it all. But I know people who've had the same obsession and they've called up like some sort of AIDS hotline, like constantly, like multiple times a day to try to get that reassurance from someone who Mm. works in the area. That's another example of a compulsion in that area. Did you notice your compulsions or your obsessive thoughts and your fears shifting? Like was it noticeable or did they overlap? Like at what point did you stop performing the rituals that kept your parents safe? And at what point did you stop thinking about all the things in the books? Yeah, it's a really good question. I don't think it was ever sudden. I think it was really gradual. And it would always be replaced by something else? Always, always Mm -hmm. replaced. The only way I could get rid of a fear was to have a new fear replace it. How exhausting. So what replaced HIV? I can't remember the exact one, but I just know at some stage, you know, going to high school, I remember being worried that I was pregnant, but I hadn't had sex. Mm -hmm. I mean, sounds ridiculous, but that was something that worried me a fair bit. I think that was... Also, I mean, I don't want to talk you out of how you felt, but I remember being absolutely obsessed with HIV because I was a teenager when the Grim Reaper campaigns came out, so I'm a bit bit older than you, and that's when I started, you know, fooling around sexually with boys and I became convinced that somehow sperm could travel through two layers of denim and (laughs) get inside me and give me HIV. Like it was traumatic those ads and every single person who saw them was deeply affected by them, particularly young people. 
it was very formative for us. But when you hit high school and you got a boyfriend, you started to be worried about other things like reputational things. Yeah, I think I started worrying about just everything to do with sexuality, I think. It's kind of a scary time for everyone, but you add OCD to it and it's just everything becomes a thousand times more scary. Can you explain that? I think it's all about uncertainty. Mm. I mean, you can never be certain about anything, right? Like there's only ever something that's probable or improbable. So certainty is just a feeling really. And there were lots of things in my life that I didn't have to be certain about. But suddenly when you're a teenager, like, you know, you're a young girl going into high school, you're immediately sexualized, especially at a co-ed school, I think. And I started just to have all these obsessions around like, I don't even know how to explain them, but there was just a bit of a worry that if I had sex with the guy, then maybe everyone would know about it. And then I'd be known as, you know, that girl who was just really easy and like Mm. your reputation would be tarnished or, and then it started, you know, I started worrying like the same thing you were saying, you know, if I'd fooled around with the guy that maybe I could get pregnant and I didn't know, and then I'd have to leave school and then I'd have to tell everyone and how embarrassing And the only way I could be sure is to have a pregnancy test. But then, you know, that still wouldn't make me feel better. And then, you know, once I was in relationships, I started worrying that I was gay, you know, like I started worrying, well, maybe I'm not attracted to this person. Maybe I'll have to leave them because I'll have to tell everyone that, you know, I'm not attracted to guys. And it was, again, like sexuality, I think is a really hard one because, There's no certainty in that either. It's just like you just feel you want to be with a guy or a girl or both or, you know, but there's never like this is what I am and this is what I'm going to be forever. So a lot of uncertainty comes into that topic, which I think is why it became like a bit of an issue for me when I was a teenager. Because it's not, you know, I've heard you say before, it's not that if you were gay, it would be bad. But it's just that you weren't, you wanted to be with this guy and what if you couldn't be with this guy because actually you were gay? It's kind of like... Absolutely. The fear isn't being gay itself. Like a lot of people who are gay and who have OCD might have the fear that they're straight and that they're going to have to leave their partner who they love. That's the fear. It's losing what you love and having to do something that you don't want to do. Mm. I feel like your mind just plays these games with you and you stop trusting yourself and it just becomes really scary because you can't be certain. I mean, I think some people call OCD the doubting disease. I think that's been thrown around before, but it's not just doubting. It's like you want to eradicate all doubt. You want to have 100% certainty on everything and you just can't. And that's what Mm. makes it so difficult. The intrusive thoughts is something that I think most people are familiar with. Like, you know, when you're on a high balcony and you look over and you think, what if I jumped? Or you look at your sleeping baby in the cot and you think, what if I dropped them? Or you imagine it's almost like dress rehearsing tragedy or catastrophe in your head. What's the difference between that, which I think most people can relate to, and the obsessiveness that is the O in OCD? Yeah, it's a really good question, Mia. Like I think everyone has intrusive thoughts, absolutely, and I feel like people who say they don't are probably lying, Mm. but I think it's kind of probably evolutionary. Like I think you have to consider all sorts of situations in your mind. It's kind of like a brainstorming activity, like have everything out there and then you can censor what you don't want or you can say, no, this is not what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. I think when it shifts into OCD is when you get into a real loop, like you can't think about anything else or you can barely do anything else until you've reached some sort of certainty in your mind because you've started to convince yourself of whatever that fear is. So, you know, it might be a really normal thought to be like, oh, imagine what it would be like to pick up this knife I have in front of me and stab someone with it. But someone with OCD might have that thought and then think, well, because I've had that thought, it must mean that I am capable of doing that. So that makes me a really terrible person. I must be a murderer. And from now on, you know, one of the compulsions in that 
instance might be I'm going to avoid going near any sharp knives Mm. or I'm going to sit here for hours and try to think of all the reasons why I'm not a murderer. So something called thought action fusion, which is really common, I think, for people with OCD, which was explained to me by my psychologist. It's like often if you have OCD, you just connect the thought straight away to the action and you think, well, that's just as bad as doing it. So I must be an awful person. Ah. And it's trying to separate those two things, which can be so useful, I guess, as part of cognitive behavioral therapy and being like, it's okay to have that thought. It doesn't mean like there's so much in between a thought and an action. And it's so normal to have this thought and it's okay to have this thought. What you say really resonates that idea of getting stuck. Like you might have a thought, an intrusive thought, an unpleasant thought, a weird thought, and it goes through your mind and you go, oh, that was weird. A bit like waking up in the morning after you've had a dream and going, oh, that was a bit weird. And then you get on with your day. But with OCD, it gets stuck on a loop. Gets stuck. It's like a record player. That gets bigger. Broken. Yes, exactly. It gets bigger and bigger and yeah you're really distressed by it and then to try to lessen that distress you start developing habits which try to neutralize that stress but they never do. I'm Mia Friedman and you're listening to No Filter with Penny Moody. When was the first time someone suggested to you you might have OCD? I think it was thrown around by a psychologist I saw when I was probably about 19 or 20, but I was so worried about like actually talking about what my thoughts were because I didn't want someone to then confirm them. I was scared Mm. that the psychologist would say, well, yeah, maybe, you know, you are a murderer or maybe you are, you know, whatever it might be. And so I really slowly went into some of my thoughts, but very, very hesitantly. And at some stage, one of my psychologists just said, oh, it could be something to do with OCD, but never really went into it. And at some stage, I felt like I wasn't getting anything out of seeing a psychologist. So I just stopped for about, I don't know, maybe six or seven years. I went on medication because they thought, well, that would help the anxiety. And it did. Absolutely, it did. I was going to ask you the difference between anxiety and OCD because some of the things you talk about I can really really yes. relate to. Yeah I think it's there's a lot of overlap and I think a lot of people still see it as an anxiety disorder but I think it kind of plays out a little bit differently like you said before you get stuck on something which you could as well with anxiety but then I think maybe the difference is developing the rituals which then become habits I think that might be a little bit of a difference there. But I feel like a lot of people who have OCD also have anxiety and also Mm. would then be very prone to depression as well. Tell me about the therapy, the treatment for OCD. What can be done? I mean, for so many years, I didn't really get treatment because I didn't know it was OCD. Once I knew it was OCD when I was about 30, I was diagnosed. What led you to that diagnosis? Amazingly, it was an article I read, I think it was in the Good Weekend in like 2013 or something. And it might have been an extract from The Guardian. I I can't remember, but it was an article written by someone who had OCD. And more specifically, they had what some people call pure O, which is more about the mental compulsions. So you can't really see the compulsions. It's more about trying to convince yourself of something or, you know, that you're not something. Do you think you've had pure O and can you give any examples of what pure O might be? Yeah, I think I've had both or types, you know, I think I've played out physical compulsions when I was younger around the contamination and HIV stuff. And I mean, like I said, with the little bit of blood on the toilet, I think from that point on, I would only ever sit down on a toilet with like one bum cheek, (laughs) like it sounds ridiculous. So I would always try to, even though I was never, like that bit of blood wouldn't be there again or I never sat on Mm. the same toilet, I would just, it became such a habit to sit this way. And then I would end up breaking like every toilet seat that I sat on because like I'd put one, (laughs) like so much pressure on one one side. It's so ridiculous. But um, so I guess that's more physical compulsions. But And do you remember the first time you put both bum cheeks on a toilet seat? (laughs) I've never asked that question before, but like that must have been a big deal. I can't remember the first time. Sometimes I feel like I still do it because Hugh Mm. sometimes laughs at me that like 
I think it wasn't long ago that one of our toilet seats was like starting to break off and he's like, oh, okay, here we go. (laughs) It's Uh, back. (laughs) It's back. (laughs) So, you know, I can't really remember that, but hopefully now I'm sitting with, you know, even weight on both bum cheeks. But um, for you, the pure O is the mental side. Yeah. So like when I was really worried about all the sexuality stuff, it would be like, like I'd often take myself off somewhere like I couldn't be around people when I was trying to think through this stuff so I'd like have a shower or like have like five showers a day or like sit on the toilet or do something and try to replay scenes in my head of like oh when I was with this guy was I feeling all the right things what was this thought that came into my head how can I rationalize that like it was just Yeah, like I said before, trying to use logic to... So you're like a detective going back over every single thing, looking for clues and signs to prove or disprove your fear. To prove or disprove, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And you could never find enough to convince you. No, you can't because there's always a what if. There's always a no but. I haven't considered this or I haven't considered that. And then you get triggered in certain situations as well, like whether that be sex or whether that be watching something on TV or whatever, you know, you you can constantly be triggered and then it can all start again. But this all plays out in your head so people don't see it. And I feel like a lot of people with OCD, I don't know, this might be generalising, but are quite sort of high achievers or people who want to be seen to be okay and so hide a lot of this stuff. Mm. You know, I think it's been called a silent epidemic because it is so tucked away. It's so hidden. Tell me about relationship OCD. That was a term that I hadn't heard before I heard you speak about it. Yeah, relationship OCD is quite common. And again, often OCD will feed upon things that are just very uncertain and relationships or the feelings you get in relationships can be very uncertain. I think it would be so normal for anyone in a relationship to every now and then question whether the person they're with is the right person for them. Especially in lockdown. (laughs) Especially in (laughs) lockdown. (laughs) On the daily. (laughs) Oh, God. Yeah, absolutely. And None of us are our best selves. No. But sorry, I don't mean to joke. But you're right. It's that genuine questioning of is this the right person for me? Should we break up? Have I made a mistake? That's all very normal and healthy. It's so no, I think it would be abnormal not to get those thoughts. But then with OCD, again, feeds off those fears and you start convincing yourself, well, if I'm having these thoughts, it must mean that I'm not in love with this person. So I'm actually doing a disservice to myself and to them by staying with them. So I'm going to have to leave. I'm going to have to leave and then I'm going to have to break up my family and so on, just Mm. snowballs. And I think people, hasn't really happened to me, but I I know of people who've had relationship OCD and because of all these thoughts coming into their head, they then have to like feel like they have to admit them to their partner and say like, these thoughts are coming in my head and I'm just not sure about this. And then of course, if the partner doesn't know you've got OCD, Mm -hmm. they start worrying, oh my gosh, this person's not in love with me. And then it can absolutely break up relationships. It can come true. And then it comes true. Mm -hmm. Or some people might be so, so distressed by these thoughts. They think, well, I'll just have to break up with this person and then I won't get these thoughts anymore. Like that's Mm -hmm. how bad it can be. So that's a really hard one because again, you're never going to have someone tell you like, yes, this person absolutely is the one for you and you're going to be with them for the rest of your life. Like it's just not going to happen. Can the idea of cheating also become a big one for a relationship OCD? It hasn't been a huge one for me, but I know of a lot of people who have OCD who have been so worried that they've cheated on their partners when they've gone out and they've had a few drinks. And so what they'll do is they'll stop drinking for example, so that they can remember everything that happened that night. Or living with the fear that they might cheat on their partner. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then again, you can imagine like trying to confess those thoughts to a partner who doesn't know what's going on. It can just make things like a thousand times worse. How have you managed your OCD within your relationships? I don't think I did particularly well, you know, in my early 20s, for example, 
I wasn't really getting much therapy. I was taking medication, which absolutely helped because I feel like I was pretty much like a walking anxiety attack before I went on medication. But I certainly didn't talk about it in any relationships I was in because I didn't have the words. I didn't know what was going on. I guess I just struggled through, I guess. And what about with Hugh? With Hugh, it was different because I started to really put all my energy into getting better, especially once I had kids and I thought, I can't keep doing this. I can't not be present in front of my kids and I don't want them to see me like this. What would they see? Like if I was with you, if I was living yeah. with you and you were going through a bout of OCD, is it something that would happen multiple times a day or once a week? And what would it look like from the outside? It probably wouldn't even be that noticeable to other people, but I think what happens to me when I get into a really bad OCD hole is like I'm just not there. Like I become Mm. a bit of a shell of a person and I can't react how I would usually react to things. I'm just totally inside my head Mm. And I'm constantly removing myself from the situation because I can't keep Mm -hmm. going as normal. Like I'm constantly just trying to get away from people because I just need to like think it out. Mm, So you'd have to take yourself away. That's how you would sort of self-soothe. You'd take yourself away and just try to think things through and convince yourself, no, yes, it's not that, it's this. Absolutely. But it's not logical, is it? It's like anxiety. It's not logical. No. Yeah, exactly. But I think um, once I was diagnosed – my aim was to find someone before I was diagnosed who specialised in OCD. Mm. So I didn't want to see someone who kind of knew a bit about it. I wanted to see someone who like, that's what they do. Mm. And it wasn't easy, but I ended up finding someone amazing who had done her PhD in OCD and she's incredible. And it completely changed my life. So she started talking to me about exposure and response prevention. And that's the absolute gold standard for treatment when it comes to OCD. But I think a lot of people don't know about it or maybe even a lot of psychologists don't practice it. I've heard of exposure therapy. Can you explain what it is? Yeah. So basically it's all about trying to live with uncertainty and being okay with that. So whatever fear you might have, you face that fear head on. So it's kind of like if you're scared of spiders, if you've got a phobia, it would be slowly introducing you to spiders and it might be at the start looking at photos of spiders and it might be watching videos and it might be going to look at one and then touching one and then holding one. It's kind of a similar thing with ERP for OCD. You make a bit of a hierarchy of your fears and then you'd put a number next to it about how much out of 100 does that scare you. And as long as you're working with a really experienced therapist, they take you through it really slowly and really gently because for so long, if you've got OCD, you'd be doing everything you can to try to avoid your fear. And this is totally the opposite. It's going face first into your fear. So say I was scared that I was going to stab someone, what might it involve? Yeah. So at the start, it might be doing something like getting your voice recorder out and making a loop tape. So making an audio recording of saying something like, maybe all my thoughts mean that I am a murderer and maybe one day I am going to pick up this knife and I am going to stab my husband in the chest. Maybe then I'll get sent off to jail and I'll be in jail for the rest of my life. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's going to happen. And it would be playing that to yourself Oh, wow. Over and over again. So I remember making a loop tape and I kind of remember what it was about, but I was listening to it on the way into work, sometimes at work, (laughs) and then on the way back from work. And then if I went for a walk, I'd be listening to it. So the idea is that at the start, the first time you listen to something like that, of course, your anxiety is going to peak, like it's going to go right up. Your heart's going to be beating out of your chest. You might start sweating. You might start shaking. You're going to have that real fight or flight response. But the whole idea is that after the 20th time, you know, it might be a little bit uncomfortable, but you're probably not going to have that same reaction. After the 100th time, it might just be boring. You're like, yeah, maybe, maybe Mm. not. That's okay. I'm not getting that same reaction. And the whole idea is to listen to it, to get that response, but then not to perform a compulsion. 
So stopping that loop. So the compulsion might be hiding the knives or avoiding the kitchen or... Yep. Yeah, Yeah, right. Absolutely. And then so you just do everything you can not to avoid that compulsion. And the really good thing is that, you know, like OCD is absolutely one of the most devastating mental illnesses, but I think it's one of the most treatable. So it's something like 70% of sufferers who might try exposure and response prevention will see a really significant decrease in their symptoms after doing it, which is pretty awesome. So there's so much hope out there for people with OCD. When you had kids and you were pregnant, that's a time of extreme uncertainty and what ifs and catastrophizing. How did that affect your OCD? Strangely enough, I felt the best I've ever felt when I was pregnant. I don't know if there's something that happened with hormones and oxytocin and all that kind of thing where it was like my OCD kind of just went away, maybe not for the first trimester, but like after that it was just like gone, which is so, so odd but so lovely, especially during that time where you don't want to be thinking about all those awful things. But then once I had Benji, my eldest, things started getting pretty hard again. And I think, you know, you combine lack of sleep with change Mm -hmm. in hormones again and that catastrophizing started again and it kind of hit with pretty full force. And that was when I decided I really needed help. And I even started, you know, Googling like inpatient facilities and I needed to just once and for all really tackle Mm -hmm. this and break this cycle. And I think there's a real problem, especially with new mums and OCD, because it's such a time of upheaval. And when you're a new mum and you start having thoughts of like harming your child, for example, what could be more distressing? It's just awful. Mm. So I know a lot of women who have really struggled in that time and it's just been horrendous. Yeah. So it's so ironic, isn't it, that so many of these things, because they're intrusive, forbidden, taboo thoughts, you feel like you can't say them out loud. You can't tell anyone. Yeah. You know, you might think, well, if I go and talk to someone, what if they report me to child protection? I mean, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put myself in that situation. So I think this is why it's so important for more education in this area, because I've talked to quite a few GPs who have said like, well, we actually didn't really learn much about OCD and so therefore we don't know how to diagnose it. And it's the same with some psychologists as well saying, well, we just didn't really, there was not much time spent on that and it's still really misunderstood in that field, which is a real worry, Mm -hmm. I think. How's things now? How have you found COVID with OCD? I mean, apart from it being dreadful generally, how's it impacted on on your OCD? And on those of your friends, you know, you've got a good support group of women with OCD. Yeah, I feel pretty lucky in that I haven't had those kind of contamination fears for a long time. And I know that COVID has really exacerbated a lot of people's OCD because, of course, everything's around washing your hands and germs and passing things on and being that one person who might spread COVID to a whole state. So I think it's been hard for a lot of people and I know a lot of people who constantly get COVID tests because they might be like working as a social worker or as a psychologist or they're just with vulnerable people and then that whole feeling of responsibility just falls on them and they think, well, I just have to, if they if I have a sniffle or if I have, you know, a tiny like sore throat or I just have to get tested straight away so I've got certainty. It's so interesting the through line through so much of what you say about your obsessions and those of some of the women that you know a lot of it is about hurting other people. Yeah I think most of it is. Yeah it's not about what if I catch it and I get sick it's about no what if I hurt someone else accidentally. Yeah absolutely and I think that's where most of the fear comes in. It's like this feeling of huge responsibility that, you know, I might be responsible for someone else getting hurt. Like everyone I know who has OCD is the most empathetic, compassionate, Mm. you know, people. And that's why these thoughts are so horrendous. Like they just can't bear the thought of it. So, yeah, to answer your question, like for me, I think it's been okay and I haven't gotten to like a really awful spiral with COVID. But I think what's been hard for me is just, you know, like everyone, just not having your normal routines and your normal life. 
and that means more time in your head and I mean I was going really well up until a few weeks ago and I was having a group therapy session online and our therapist asked us to give our OCD a number out of 10 so 10 being the worst it's ever been and one being the best it's ever been and I gave it three I was like oh I haven't had you know, OCD thoughts in years, probably like really, it hasn't been bad in a long time. And I feel like I'm in recovery and it's all great. And I totally jinxed myself. Honestly, like three days later, I was a 10. Oh, wow. And I was just in this awful, Mm. awful place for a couple of days. And I'd never really done this before, but I started going to Hugh for reassurance and being like, these are my thoughts. Mm. And he'd be like on the way out to a talk or whatever. And I'd be like, Mm. you know, this is what's going through my mind. Please like, don't give me reassurance, but then do please give me, you know, like, because I know it doesn't help at the end of the day, but I just needed that, like someone to tell me like, no, it's okay. It's fine. You're okay. And so I was really lucky. I was able to have a few like emergency sessions with my psychologist and, you know, it, after a few days, it kind of petered out again. But for a few days, I just couldn't be there. I couldn't parent. I couldn't do anything. Mm. You know, it was just really awful. And that hasn't happened to me in a really long time. But it kind of just reminded me that, I don't know, maybe it's here for the long run. I don't know. Well, it's something you live with. It's something you live with. It's kind of, I think, mm. all forms of mental ill health. It's like being an addict or an alcoholic. Totally, or, yeah. It's like you've always got it. It's just Mm. how you're managing it at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If anyone's listening to this and thinking, oh, now that makes sense, now I get it, either about themselves or someone that they love, what should they do? Like where's a good place to go to do more reading or understand it a little bit better? Yeah, it's a really good question, Mia. It's Um, so hard to get into psychologists at the moment. It's so hard. It's really hard at the moment to get into see anyone. Something that my friend and I are trying to do is we're putting together a website at the moment called soocd.com.au. The idea is to have a whole lot of resources Mm. in one place for people in Australia so that they can read about the symptoms, read about treatment options and look for specific specialists in each state. So we're not quite finished with that yet. But in the meantime, there were a few really good places to go. Like there's the International OCD Foundation, which has got really good information on there. Yeah, there are a few other websites. One's called madeofmillions.com, I think, where you can go just to get a little bit more understanding. I mean, I think the key to OCD is understanding it. Once you understand Mm. it, you can start tackling it and you can start separating your thoughts from yourself. But yeah, if you you don't understand it, it makes things really difficult. There are also some really good books as well, which might be really useful for people. Yeah, like what? There's one called Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder by Jonathan Grayson. And there's also one which I've talked about before, which is called The Man Who Couldn't Stop. Mm, I've heard you talk about that. I think he's a science writer, but he talks about his own experience with OCD. Oh, that sounds amazing. We'll put all of those in the show notes. I mean, you just have to find really reputable resources because if you've got OCD and you start Googling stuff, it can actually start confirming all the fears you've got. And you don't want that. You just want to really understand the facts about it. And I guess my other advice would be just do what you can to get a mental health plan and to start finding someone who does do exposure and response therapy because there's such a good chance that you'll beat it or that you'll, you know, you'll be able to manage it really well. It takes a lot of courage to be as open and as candid as Penny was. I'm sure you'll agree. And I'm so grateful for the trust that she had in me and in you and in everyone who's listened to her story with an open mind and an open heart. When people like Penny trust me with their stories it has an enormous impact to make change for people who don't share their experience it means that they learn more about it and for people who do it means that they feel seen and heard and understood and at Mamma Mia that's our core purpose quite simply to make the world a better place for women by making them feel seen and heard and understood I know that there will be some of you after listening to that who might have felt like you suddenly understand something about yourself or maybe about someone you know. 
after you've listened to Penny's story. If that's the case, I encourage you to follow the links we've put in our show notes that Penny has suggested if you want to learn more about OCD or relationship OCD. Thank you for listening to this episode of No Filter. You can also join me, Holly Wainwright and Jesse Stevens, three times a week. We do a podcast called Mamma Mia Out Loud. And our filter for that show, there is a filter, I'm like, no filter. Uh, we talk about all the things that women are actually talking about. That's how we choose the topics we discuss. Uh, and you can get that show wherever you get your podcasts. It's a great listen and a great way to stay across everything that's going on. The assistant producer of No Filter is Lucy Neville. The executive producer is Liz Ratliff and I'm Mia Friedman. I'll see you on the Mamma Mia app. You can do a lot in eight minutes. Hard boil an egg, swim four laps in an Olympic pool, meditate, listen to Pay Ya by Outcast twice and even change your life. Mamma Mia's newest podcast, Eight Minutes to Change Your Work Life, will revolutionise not only how you do your job or run your business, but also make you feel great about doing it. Every week for eight minutes, host and viral productivity expert Deborah Ho will be joined by efficiency gurus and super smart business owners to uncover the secrets that will change how you work and make you happier in the process. Check out Eight Minutes to Change Your Work Life in your podcast app today. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures.